a number of years ago, I had the privilege of preaching in a church that my grandfather started in northern India way back at the first half of the 1900s. Now, my grandfather, as I've told you before, he went to India to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and along the way, he started an orphanage, a school, a medical clinic, and this church. Uh, so after I preached the Sunday sermon at this church, they held a huge outdoor banquet in my honor. I was a VIP. And they put out tables and they spread them with steaming platters of lamb curry and spicy rice plow. And so I sat down in my chair and there was my, uh, my plate and my cup, but there were no eating utensils. And that's because my guests, my Indian hosts, they don't use a fork and a knife. They eat with their hands. And that was problematic to me for a couple of reasons. It was a problem, uh, first of all, because I don't have the skill that they have. It was just wonderful to watch them wad up a little ball of rice and dip it into the lamb curry and pop it into their mouth. I don't have that skill. And secondly, I'm left-handed. You say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, in that part of India, the left hand is customarily used for a certain bathroom activity. Yeah. So fortunately, my guests, they could see the hungry and frustrated look on my face, so they gave me a fork, and I had a wonderful meal. Have you ever had an experience, a cross-cultural experience like that? So here I had traveled thousands of miles to be with this group of people, and yet obviously I was not one of them. I was with them, but not one of them. Amazingly, Jesus Christ traveled the great distance from heaven to earth to be with us, but not just to be with us. He became one of us. Jesus became human. Theologians refer to this as the doctrine of the incarnation, and that's our topic today, why God's Son became one of us you brought a Bible with you, would you turn with me to the New Testament book of Hebrews? Okay, Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, we're beginning a new series, six-part series today. This is the first installment. It's a Bible-savvy series, and by Bible-savvy, we mean it tracks with our uh, Christ Community Church's daily Bible-savvy reading schedule. Uh, it is our goal this year, our mega goal as a church, to get everybody reading the Bible regularly. And so we know that many of you are already on board. You're following the Bible Savvy schedule. Maybe you're doing it as a family. Perhaps you're doing it in your community group as well. Fantastic. But we want everybody on board. So if you've not started yet, we hope that this series that's going to be going through the same passages in the sermons that you're reading during the week will motivate you to get started. You could pick up a reading schedule online at our website, ccclife.org, or you could get it on the mobile app on your phone or your, your iPad. You could also find there an electronic copy of our Bible Savvy Journal, or you could get a hard copy of the journal where, where each day you could record a line or two, something God taught you through the text. Now, if you follow the Bible Savvy reading schedule during this series, uh, you'll notice that it toggles back and forth between the Old Testament book of Leviticus and the New Testament book of Hebrews. So every day, it's either Hebrews or Leviticus. Why did we arrange it that way? Well, for starters, because we know that the Old Testament book of Leviticus is a graveyard for Bible readers. So people start reading the Bible in the book of Genesis, and they're enthusiastic, and by the time they get to Exodus, it's the second book, they've slowed down a little bit, and then they get to Leviticus and come to a dead halt. Because of all those strange Old Testament laws and the detailed description of Israel's ancient Israel's sacrificial system, and you're, you're left wondering, well, what possible application could there be to my life? Well, those Old Testament laws and sacrifices were the means of atoning for sin, for getting right in a relationship with a holy God who ha has been alienated by our sin. A and the Old Testament laws and sacrifices also point ahead to the coming of the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ. So the writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to a group of Jewish Christians and helping them make the connection between these Old Testament laws and sacrifices and Jesus. That's why Leviticus and Hebrews go together. 
But we're also doing this series because it's the Lent series season. It's the, the period of time, the 40 days leading up to Good Friday and Easter, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so we always like to do a Jesus-focused series during this time so that Easter doesn't catch us by surprise. You know, sometimes Easter kind of sneaks up on you and it's gone before you know it's there. It's not like Christmas where there's a long ramp up. So we try to ramp up to Easter every, every year so that by the time we get to Holy Week, we are savoring our Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. So if you're, you're open to Hebrews chapter 2, uh, the passage we're looking at today explains why Jesus, as God's son, had to become one of us. Okay, wh why did he have to become human in order to save us? Why couldn't he just save us as God? Four answers to that question from Hebrews chapter 2. So if you haven't taken the outline out yet, you may want to get it uh, on your phone or your mobile app and uh, follow along. So number one, why did Jesus become uh, become one of us. Number one, to be the pioneering savior. To be the pioneering savior. Now we're going to uh, begin with just one verse, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. So follow along as I read. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So the writer of Hebrews identi identifies Jesus in this verse as the pioneer of our salvation. Uh, but the writer doesn't identify himself. Nowhere in the book of Hebrews are we told who wrote this epistle, which is kind of unusual. If you've read any of Paul's epistles, he always begins by saying, hey, this is being written by Paul. But we don't have that here. Now, over the centuries, some scholars have figured, well, maybe Paul wrote this, but he just forgot to sign it. Or uh, maybe his signature got lost over the years. Uh, but most Bible scholars say, no, no, the language here, the writing style, the vocabulary is not that of the Apostle Paul. This was definitely written by somebody else. But somebody who is obviously a leader in the early church, because there's some pretty profound theology here. And this letter was warmly received in the early church, indicating that they knew they respected whoever it was who wrote it. So we don't know who wrote it, but we, we know it was a leader in the early church, and he identifies Jesus as the pioneer of our salvation. A pioneer is a word that means trailblazer, which leads to the question, where was Jesus blazing a trail to? And this takes us to the storyline of the Bible. Okay, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, God creates the original human couple, Adam and Eve, places them in a virtual paradise, the Garden of Eden, and they enjoy this incredible, this intimate relationship, fellowship with the God of the universe. But they threw it all away. They decided to flagrantly disobey God, to go their way instead of God's way. And so they were banished from the Garden of Eden. And scripture teaches that we all follow in Adam and Eve's footsteps. We all choose to go our way instead of God's way. We disobey God countless times every day. And so we distance ourselves from a holy God. We alienate this holy God. And Romans 3 verse 23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we need a pioneer. We need a trailblazer who will come and blaze the trail back to God. Get us back to Eden, as it were. And that's Jesus. Wh whose goal, according to the opening line of the verse I just read to you, is to bring many sons and daughters to glory. That's what makes him the pioneer. The pioneer. Now, Pioneering is brutal. Pioneering is brutal. This past year, I uh, read a book by Pulitzer Prize winning historian David McCulloch called The Pioneers. And it's written about those settlers who in the early 1800s uh, settled the Northwest Territory, the territory that later became the states of Ohio and Indiana and Michigan and Illinois and Wisconsin. And it was difficult. I mean, if you've got this image, this picture of pioneers as, you know, kind of living in a cozy little cabin with a stream of smoke coming up from the chimney, 
helping their neighbors harvest bountiful crops each year, working side by side, sending their kids to a one-room schoolhouse where little girls in calico dresses are chased by little boys in bib overalls. Think again, that's hallmark, okay? That's not reality. That's not the real experience of the pioneers. So David McCullough describes a life marked by intense loneliness, brutal Indian attacks, near starvation, exhausting nonstop work, howling winds, no doctors, no teachers, uh, no indoor plumbing, no retirement benefits. Listen to what McCullough writes about pioneer women. He says, a woman's work was never done from first light to setting sun. There were no days off, no vacations. Besides cooking, baking, cleaning, the full-time role of wife and mother, there were cows to milk, gardens to tend, candles and soap to be made, butter to churn, yarn to spin, wool to weave, clothes to make for large families, clothes to wash, mend and patch, etc., etc. Now, why am I painting this picture of the pioneer life? Because Jesus became one of us in order to be the pioneering savior. Now, Jesus left the comfort. He left the splendor. He left the glory of heaven so that he could blaze a trail to a restored relationship with God. The son of God entered our world as a helpless baby laid in a feed trough in a cold dirty smelly unsanitary stable you know he grew up as the son of a carpenter working hard alongside his dad joseph and in those days carpenters not only worked with wood they worked with stone chiseling away he grew up in a family with siblings who mocked him you know, any mention of Messiahship drew a laugh, a mocking laugh from them. They didn't believe in Jesus till after his resurrection. He went from village to village during his three years of, of ministry, constantly surrounded by antagonists who were trying to catch him in any, any false word, surrounded by desperately needy people, surrounded by a group of 12 friends who cut and ran the moment Jesus found himself in trouble, arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then, of course, there was the brutal cruelty of the cross. Jesus lived the life of a pioneer. Why? So he could blaze the trail back to God for you and for me. Why did God's son become one of us? Number one, to be the pioneering savior. Number two, to be the perfect savior. Okay, back to Hebrews chapter two. Let, let me repeat verse 10 and then we'll continue on. So in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect, should make him perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Again, you see the humanity of Jesus emphasized here. We're family. We're brothers and sisters. In the assembly, Jesus says, I will sing your praises. And, and again, God, I'll put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Now, what does the writer of Hebrews mean? when he says that God made Jesus perfect. You see that? God made Jesus perfect. Did Jesus have some moral flaws that needed to be weeded out? No. In fact, elsewhere in Hebrews, the writer says that Jesus was totally sinless. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15, referring to Jesus. It says, we have a high priest who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Hebrews 7 verse 26 describes Jesus as holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. So Jesus was not made perfect in the sense of removing his moral flaws. Uh, Jesus was made perfect in the sense that he had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to either obey or disobey God, and he consistently chose obedience. He was perfectly obedient, perfectly. You know, even when the obedience led him to the cross, 
You remember that scene in the Garden of Eden when Jesus is, is praying, he know, knows what he's about to face, and he says in so many words, Father, I don't really want to do this, but if this is what you want me to do, I'm all in. Perfectly obedient, even to the point of death on a cross. Jesus became one of us so that he could be the perfect, the totally obedient Savior. Now, there is a flip side to this truth. See, Jesus not only constantly pursued perfect obedience, perfect holiness, he also wants to produce that in his followers, in you and me. So go back to verse 11 for a moment here. Uh, look again at the opening line. It says, both the one who makes people holy, that would be Jesus, and those who are made holy, hopefully that's us, are of the same family. Did you know that Jesus wants to make you holy? Jesus wants to make you holy. Jesus wants to make you totally obedient, perfectly obedient to the Father, just as he is. Now, the Bible has a word for this. The word is sanctification. And there, there are two stages to Jesus' sanctifying work in us. Stage one is when Jesus dies on the cross to take the punishment for our sins so that if we'll surrender our lives to him, we could be totally forgiven. Our sins can be washed away. That's stage one of sanctification. It's a one-time event. Surrender to Christ. Have you ever done that? Stage two. Stage two of sanctification, however, is an ongoing process. It happens every day. I mean, we face countless opportunities to grow in our obedience to God, to be perfected by saying no to sinful, sinful temptations and saying yes to whatever it is God asks us to do in his word. Now, is that easy? Well, of course it's not easy. But keep in mind that Jesus obeyed God to the point of laying down his life on the cross. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, later on in chapter 12, verse 4, he chides us for being so wimpy when it comes to our obedience. He says, you have not yet resisted sin to the point of shedding your blood, have you? You know, in other words... Quit whining about how difficult it is to obey God and keep in mind that Jesus' obedience led him all the way to the cross. He shed his blood. He shed his blood for your sake. Now, it's easy to object at this point. Well, yeah, Jesus was able to consistently obey God because <laughs> Jesus was God. Second person of the Trinity. So when Jesus faced sinful temptation, no doubt he just hit the God power button and, and he cruised over that temptation, nothing to it. But that's hardly the picture we get of Jesus in the gospel accounts, the biographies of his life in the New Testament. You know, there was that occasion when Jesus went toe to toe with Satan himself in the wilderness. And Jesus faced Satan not in his deity, he faced him in his humanity. You know, Jesus had two weapons in his arsenal, which are still available to Christ followers today. Jesus called upon the Spirit. As scripture says that it was the Spirit who led him into the wilderness to face Satan. So the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, comes to indwell us when we put our hope and trust in Christ. And now he strengthens us. He gives us resolve to walk in obedience to God. And the second piece of weaponry that Jesus had was the Word of God. Remember how every time Satan threw a temptation at him, Jesus responded with a scripture. No doubt he had read the scriptures, studied the scriptures, memorized the scriptures. And so he calls us to walk in obedience to the Father just as he has, to be perfected, to be sanctified. Now again, this is not easy because sin comes so naturally to us. In fact, we use the natural uh, naturalness of sin to excuse it in our lives, don't we? To justify it. You know, of course, I ringed out that driver who cut me off in traffic. That's the natural thing to do. It's, it's so natural to share that juicy bit of gossip to a coworker. It's, it's so natural to spend all of my income on myself. It's so natural for some to be drawn into a same-sex relationship. In fact, that's the justification today. 
Okay, it's natural. How could it possibly be wrong? It's natural to goof off at home when my boss thinks I'm working on company time. It's natural to cruise the internet looking for porn. See, every sin you can think of that Scripture prohibits is natural to us. That's no excuse to do it. Jesus calls us to walk in obedience to God the Father just as he did. The perfect Savior gives us the Spirit of God, gives us the Word of God, and asks us to follow. Why did Jesus, why did God's Son become one of us? To be, number two, the perfect Savior and to call us to follow. Number three, to be the powerful Savior. Okay, back to Hebrews chapter two. We're gonna pick it up at verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. See this constant emphasis. Jesus became one of us. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, at first glance, it seems as if the writer of Hebrews is promoting some bad theology here, right? I mean, he, he tells us that the, the devil holds the power of death, which enables him to rule over humans. But that's not correct, is it? I mean, Satan doesn't have the power of death. God does. Satan doesn't rule over us. God does. Well, consider these other scriptures. 1 John 5, verse 19, we know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Ephesians 2, verse 2, you used to follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work and those who are disobedient. Satan's the ruler of the air. In John chapter 12, verse 31, and again in John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus refers to Satan as the prince of this world. So does that mean that God is not in control of the world, that Satan has somehow managed to wrestle the power of life and death away from God? No. God is still the ultimate ruler. However, God determined way back at the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden to give humans the freedom to choose their ruler. He knew that some would choose him, hopefully, you know, and so because he is the source of life, they would experience life and others may choose themselves to be the ruler Go their own way instead of God's way. Disconnect from the giver of life. And the consequence of disconnecting is death. Well, as it worked out, we all chose different, a different ruler than God. We all chose to go our way instead of God's way. Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. This is how it get, gets started. God gives Adam and Eve a test case. He says, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Eat from any tree in the garden except that one. This is a test case. And Adam and Eve rejected God's rule. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They chose death. And humans have been rejecting God's rule and choosing death ever since. Romans 6, verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death death so if it see, listen if it seems that satan has the power of death it's because we gave it to him we gave it to him and he then uses our fear of death to tyrannize our lives so how can we break free from the power of death how can we break free from the the fear of death pretty important question I Googled fear of death this week. I wanted to see what uh, secular writers have to say about it. I, I learned, first of all, that there is a word for this phobia. It's called thanatophobia. Thanatos from the Greek word death, fear of death. We all got a bad case of it, thanatophobia. But according to the, uh, the articles I read online, there are many symptoms of this fear of death in our lives, but there are cures as well. Okay, if you got the fear of death, there is psychotherapy, there is medication you can take, there are relaxation exercises, 
breathing in and out slowly. You can even get an app for your phone. It's called Calm, and it will take care of your fear of death. Really? Here's the problem, friends. Even if we could somehow manage to stifle our fear of death, it wouldn't change the fact that we're all going to die. Okay, the reality can't be swept aside. And Tim Keller says that maybe the fear of death is a helpful thing and that it alerts us so that we deal with the reality, the reality of death. Tim was a pastor in New York City for several decades, a best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author, one of my favorite authors, and he's just written a new book called On Death. On his short book, Short read, 100 pages or so, I recommend it to you, especially poignant because Tim is currently battling pancreatic cancer. And in his book on death, Tim says that the fear of death is like, and I quote, spiritual smelling salts that will awaken us out of our false belief that we will live forever. Smelling salts. We're not going to live forever. Smelling salts. We're going to die smelling salts. We're going to stay dead, forever dead, unless we find the key to eternal life. Smelling salts. So what's the key? Well, the better way to phrase the question is, who is the key? And the key is Jesus. You go back to chapter 2, verse 14, middle of the verse. says, "So, so that by his death... Jesus might break the power of him who holds the power of death. So how did Jesus' death on the cross break Satan's power of death? Well, remember, Satan only has the power of death because what? Because we gave it to him by our sin. And so Jesus comes along and he takes the punishment that our sins deserve and he offers us forgiveness and new life when we surrender to him. And when we do that and our sins are dealt with, then the power of death is broken. The power of death is broken. And that means we no longer have to fear death as if it's the end of our lives. It's actually just the doorway into eternal life. You know, Francis Collins, the brilliant geneticist, the you know, guy behind the genome project that uh, unraveled the mysteries of, of DNA, this is what led him to faith in Christ. Okay, at the time, he was a hospital physician working with terminally ill patients, and he noticed something. He noticed that most people end their lives terrorized by death, except for Christ followers. He noticed a peace that they seemed to possess. They didn't seem to be enslaved by the fear of death. And this led Collins to a a search for what was behind this and to the discovery of Christ, the powerful Savior. The powerful Savior. Number four, why did God's Son become one of us? Number four, to be the priestly Savior. Going back one last time to Hebrews chapter 2, pick it up at verse 16. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. Again, the emphasis on Jesus' humanity. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, Jesus became a merciful and faithful high priest. That expression, high priest, uh, this is the first time it's used in the book of Hebrews, but it pops up 17 times. Now, an Old Testament priest, you could read about him in the book of Leviticus, Okay, the Old Testament priest, he had a job. His job was to offer sacrifices, animal sacrifices, to take the punishment for people's sins. And because the priest himself was human, he, of course, could identify with sinful people. He could empathize with them. He, he got temptation. All right, He understood their, their moral frailty. He was experienced at sinning himself because he was human. 
You know, I'm sometimes amused when I'm, I'm talking to someone who is divulging to me uh, aspects of their messy life. And, and they start talking to me as if, I, I know you don't get it because you're a pastor. <laughs> I want to say, of course I don't, you know, because we pastors, we never sin. So we never get angry at our wives. We never lose it when we're in, in, in traffic. We never, uh, you know, look for the wrong thing on the internet. We never medicate our discouragement by, uh, you know, going to some substance that, that, will, that will lessen the pain. We, we, you know, we, we never fudge on the truth. We never hold a grudge. I am superhuman. I am your pastor. <laughs> of course I'm not. And neither was the high priest. And that's why they could be so merciful with people, so empathetic. But you say, what about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity? He's God. And yet verse 17 says he's a merciful high priest. Why? Verse 18, because he suffered when he was tempted. You say, how did Jesus suffer? Okay, well, in the ultimate sense, Jesus suffered because he was determined to obey God all the way to the cross. So he kept saying no you know, to any detour and yes to God, all the way to giving his life on the cross, suffering for us. But he also suffered, friends, every day. He suffered because he never gave in to temptation. Now, you stop and think about it for a moment. How do we often find relief from temptation? We give in, right? So you're, you're tempted by lust or by greed or by selfishness or by way, and it, and it builds up, builds up, and you're resisting, resisting, and finally you say, oh, the heck with it, and you just roll with it. And you experience immediate relief. Now there's guilt that comes later, but you get relief immediately. Jesus never rolled with it. Never. Never let the air out of the balloon. He suffered when he was tempted. And so the scripture says he is able to help those who are tempted. Now, if your Bible is in front of you, the word help appears a couple of times in these verses. I want you to mark it in your Bible. Verse 16, Jesus helps Abraham's descendants. Abraham's descendants is just a phrase that means people who have put their hope and trust in God. And then in verse 18, Jesus is able to help there's a second time, help those who are being tempted. Now, the word help, according to Bible scholars, means to grasp the hand of, okay, to take by the hand. Interestingly, a few chapters later in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 9, we read that God in Old Testament times took ancient Israel by the hand to deliver them from slavery in Egypt and to freedom. And when we're caught into temptation, Jesus says, call out to me. And you know what I'll do? I'll grasp you by the hand and I'll lead you to freedom. I'll lead you to freedom. You know, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common, what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You know, have you ever fallen into some pattern of sin because you, you convinced yourself that the temptation is just too strong to resist? Nonsense, Paul says. Everybody experiences temptation. And God always provides a way out. Now, if you're struggling in some area and you're saying, yeah, but I just can't take the exit. I just don't take the, the out that God provides. Okay, maybe at this point, one of the ways God wants to come alongside and assist you, one of the ways Jesus wants to grasp your hand is through the provision of a good Christian counselor or, or, or our care night on a Tuesday night, or even just in your community group, if you're in a group, when was the last time you, you said to your group members, here's an area I'm tempted in, here's what I struggle with, I need your prayers and accountability. You know, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus understands what you're wrestling with. He's been there. He's one of us. Reach out to him when you're facing temptation. He will grab you by the hand and lead you to freedom. Would you pray with me? 
you know, as we pray, just let's toggle through in our minds, scroll through the four points of today's sermon. Jesus became one of us. Why? First of all, so he could be the pioneer. He could blaze the trail back to God. If you've never come back to God, Jesus opened the way. Surrender your life to him today. Say, I want you to be my savior and the, the pioneer, the leader of my life. Jesus became one of us to be the perfect savior, totally obedient to God. He wants to make you obedient. So tell him today, Jesus, I, I want to walk in step with you. I want to obey the Father. I need your spirit and your word, the resources you give me to help me do that. He's the powerful Savior. If you've been fearing death, if you've been fearing COVID, overly fearful of COVID, there is one who will set you free. It's not the Calm app on your phone. It's Jesus who conquered death by conquering sin. He wants to set you free today. And he's the priestly Savior. Okay, he is the one who wants to reach out and grab you by the hand if you'll grab hold of his hand. He is the one who has suffered in his temptation. So he knows what it is you're going through and wants to relieve you, wants to take you out of the mire today. Put your hope and trust in him. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being such a wonderful savior, for becoming one of us. Accept our praise today, we pray in your name. Amen.